uh, is that um, we make a little thing, it's kind of like quantum mechanics where you, you have something that starts on the left and ends on the right, so I, I put the uh, re re ratio of the frequency of the receiver to the source uh, as R over S. In other words, I actually think of that line as having a little slant to it. This, this over that. Always the source is in the denominator for this definition of stuff we're going to talk about here. And the logarithm of that ratio, receiver to source, is the rho that we were talking about earlier that makes the hyperbolic functions we'll work with in a fairly standard way, actually. And it has a name. It's called rapidity. And you don't see it very often. It's just kind of hidden in some papers. They'll talk about it and then it goes away. Uh, this is really important. Rapidity having a logarithm is really important because, uh, for example, if you ask how fast is going a proton uh, in the, high, uh, coll uh, the uh, European uh, Hadron Collider, and it's 9999999, roughly. I mean, it's a lot of nines. Who wants to do arithmetic with all those nines? Right? Well, taking the logarithm of this thing, the Doppler shift is also quite extensive for that, and lots of numbers. But the logarithm, huh, it's about seven. The hadron is up to seven in rapidity. And compared to things that are out in space, that's nothing. That thing's a little uh, toy compared to what's going on in some things. And every once in a while, one of these things comes through the atmosphere and we realize how, how much energy there is uh, hiding out there. Anyway, that's the number that we play with here. And uh, what I want to show you is that that particular quantity, using that as a measure of velocity, is really cool. Because then Galileo, who we've completely defeated here, comes back. And he gets to do his sum rule with rapidity, and it works perfectly. That's what I want to I'll make sure I I'll show you here. So here I am doing 600 over 300 uh, for uh, Alice as the source and Bob as the receiver. Okay, so it's a 2 to 1 ratio. And then the rapidity is a logarithm of that, so that comes out to be a decimal. Fraction started with it's not. Um, it was rational. Uh, and then I could uh, do the experiment in reverse, and I would uh, have uh, the uh, person with this uh, laser uh, being receiving uh, uh, from, if you turn this into a laser and send the light back, uh, that would be the logarithm of the flip. That would be minus. So the relative velocity, Bob to Alice, Alice to Bob, okay, th that is what we're, we're talking about here. And meanwhile, uh, Carl is down the line here picking up Alice's a light as well, and we're seeing a 400 over 300 ratio for her, and the logarithm of that is 0.2866, okay? So, uh, let's take this ahead here a little bit and show that Galileo's revenge, this is part one of his revenge today, uh, rapidity adds just like Galilean velocity because if I'm uh, 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 answering the question here of um, uh, and what we really are, are asking here is Carla's rapidity relative to Bob, how do you get that? Um, or in this case, uh, I'm talking about uh, Al Alice-Carla uh, Doppler ratio. Well, here's the, uh, how I use that uh, to get uh, Bob-Carla Doppler ratio. I just say, okay, I've got Carla over Bob, but let me just stick in Alice off the diagonal, this is our chainsaw sum uh, thing again here, but a really elementary version of it, right? Okay, so it's the product of these two. It gives me two-thirds. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here, two-thirds. Okay, so if we put it in an exponent, which is what we do to get the, the uh, actual Doppler shift, the Doppler shift is given by the exponential of the rapidity, then just sum. Bingo! I can, you know, 
This is the only picture I can find where Galileo is smiling. All the rest of him, he's really grumpy. But here, he's had his revenge. He was right all along. He just meant rapidity. It works perfectly. And that's because it's a group parameter for the Lorentz group. That's the way you could say it. You're going to be a mathematical about the whole thing. Okay? All right. Well, we've got a couple more uh, revenges for him coming up here. And that, uh, I couldn't find any bigger smile for the guy, so we'll have to do the one we've already gotten and uh, talk about interference. That is what uh, makes us have uh, our relativity coordinate system and eventually our quantum mechanics uh, of the whole stick, basically, uh, for uh, this. So, um, what I want you to uh, realize is that when we ask what, uh, what's going on with uh, two phasers, uh, one of them, say, a, a slow speed of red, infrared, and then I got green here with 600 terahertz, it's only 300, or something like that. This one's going around a lot slower than this one, and so uh, eventually they, they get close to each other and they make a great big lump called a beat, or a group envelope, uh, the top of the group envelope, and, um, okay, that's something I think that you uh, have seen already uh, in uh, any sort of, t anybody talking about uh, wave interference, but we'll, we'll just take it a little bit further, because what I'm saying is that you can uh, look at that from the point of view of, say, the red beam. Let's just let the red beam stand still, we'll just add a frequency to everything, and that you can do, you can add your phase, you can make relative phase uh, the important thing and then have any value that you add to all of them, it'll still be the same physics. So this is kind of a beginning of gauge and variance and all that kind of stuff right here. So, uh, real quick, let's go uh, back to the old Pirelli site uh, that we had and show the two right next to each other, okay? So what you're seeing here, and this is the diagram I want, that's the thing that we're going to be uh, part of our roadmap uh, before we're done here. But anyway, here's the green guy going real fast compared to the red guy. And every once in a while, uh, they get opposite each other, and then a half uh, beat period later, they get uh, in, in cahoots, and so you have an oscillation. Same oscillation that you have here. Okay, but it's got this weird Thales a structure there. You see that uh, diameter rotating there? Always a right angle to the very last and then a minus right angle and so forth. That's important. That is, that's Galileo's second revenge right there, is that you, when you uh, interfere two waves, you get to add them, add their phases. And I don't care how fast these waves are frequency in frequency or how fast they're moving. It can be a sound wave. They do the same. The, ro the rules are the same uh, for that. Now, this particular uh, one here, if I can bring this thing up, um, <clears throat> I think I can go back here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I uh, would like to show uh, the um, actual, uh, let's go. Uh, I'll just go to the home of this thing. I'll go to the site map where that thing is. And you, you should learn how to use the site map, and I have to refresh my memory how to use this, the site uh, map. But what I'm looking for are the beats, and I believe I'm going to find it right here. Light meets light. And uh, you just go clicking along here. There's a typical red versus green, or combs versus each other. There's if you want to teach beats, that's a neat way to do it on an overhead projector. Uh, here you can see how they add up and then subtract and so forth. Okay, and it's a, it's a difference over two. That's really important. Okay, and uh, that's sort of the geometry of the thing right there. There's the uh, half sum that uh, uh, we're going to be working with very shortly here. That half sum is really important. And here, here it's like that half sum and half difference. We need both of those uh, concepts. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to be doing an analysis of the group wave making a coordinate system and we're going to be doing it by factoring a sum. This sum right here. Factoring it into this times this. 
Okay, so this is this this group apart. The difference is something that's real slow. It's got a long wavelength, slow frequency, maybe, but certainly it's a fat thing compared to a you know much more wrinkly thing. Uh, that's the sum. Okay, so the product of those two, which is the way that we end up getting that factors those, uh, the, the two factors give me this. Okay, so they're the guts of the wave, which we call the phase, and then there's the envelope we call the skin. Okay, we're being uh, using medical terminology or something here. Okay, all right, so that, that that's worth seeing, and then the geometry of the uh, one where it does the uh, Thales construction is really important. Okay, uh, back to uh, the uh, lecture here and forward. Um, here's where we actually make this stuff right now. And this is where we're going to be doing the construction of, of the construction uh, of the uh, of what the interference is. But first it's really trivial. It's a standing wave, but what does a standing wave have? It has a coordinate system. That's what no one seems to have taken advantage of. The fact that I put two, a one CW coming from the right and one from the left, this is what I get. Okay. So uh, I can do this uh, simulation, I think, uh, immediately here by clicking on this. Let's see what happens, just for the sake of uh, fun. Okay. So here is a wave coming in with the imaginary part, imagination preceding reality by pi over 2, another one coming, so the imaginary part is on the front side of the motion, and what we're making is a wave that every once in a while, the real part of that wave is bang everywhere, right? The phase of this wave, which I'm indicating by this uh, as the half sum of a baseball diamond. And uh, the basic idea is that we're going to uh, be constructing uh, what we get uh, in um, a baseball diamond in which there's a Doppler shift. But right now there's no Doppler shift. I've got 600 terahertz on both these lasers. They're both the beautiful blue-green uh, laser. Okay? So, um, as shown in the middle slide there, or the far right, the uh, sum, one half of the right hand amplitude plus the left hand amplitude, that's what you're dealing with for this thing. And it's, this is first base, this is second base up here, that'd be the sum of the two. This is third base over here, P for pitcher's mouth. Okay, nice mnemonics, all right? Meanwhile, I, I used to call this the dugout, but then Woody across the line says, hey, no, that's the grandstand. I mean, G for grandstand. Okay, so now I've got it in the front of the, of the word. We're full mnemonic. And um, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see how all of these quantities, the grandstand, the right, the left, uh, the first base and third base, and the pitcher's mound change as I run through this thing and Doppler shift one of these into the blue and the other one into the red. That's the whole trick right there that makes this possible for us to do uh, what we're uh, setting out to do here. Okay? Now this, this should be easy stuff. So if there's something here that you didn't catch, now's the time. Ask, because we're going to be doing this for, for another two days, but we would like to use it that time uh, efficiently. Okay, so if you have something that, you, you know, I, I just think it's wonderful that in the uh, per space time, and here I'm writing angular frequency and angular wave number, 2 pi times kappa, 2 pi times nu, 2 pi for every one of these phasers down there, uh, rotation gives you a 2 pi for the kind of frequency we use to calculate uh, everything that happens to waves that involves that interference effect. Well, this guy is straight up, that's got a slope of infinity, and that's what this does. Bang! It's everywhere. It's going infinitely fast uh, for an instant there. And that's what you need to make a coordinate system. In order to make a coordinate system, you really need the phase. The, the heartbeat of the wave makes the coordinate system crossbars 
Otherwise, you just have these guys uh, straight up. That's the group. The group part here has zero slope. Okay, and that's, that's what a, a reciprocal space does for you. It's turning everything up here upside down in the arithmetic. So we have two points on this keyboard of the gods. And you can see, by doing stuff like that, making these different, I'm going to be able to cover the whole darn uh, space. I, I can use every key on the keyboard of the gods piano. I don't have to just confine myself to one line here and one line here, or in the other, a line coming out of here for the other dim another dimension, right? That makes a cone, that's called the light cone, right? just to get you connected with what you usually hear in relativity. I'll talk about the light cone, and they hardly ever do much with that cone. Okay, so um, let's go ahead here. Uh, now this you can look at in your own time. It shows you a little bit how to use the control panel for Borat that's making this particular graph. And there are all kinds of very strange graphs that you can uh, pull up uh, and play with uh, in this uh, uh, scenario that we have. Um, here is a more explicit uh, picture of the, uh, of the arithmetic that's going into uh, making this. And the basic idea is we're adding two phasers. We're adding two e to the i something. e to the i some phase and then e to the i a phase with a sign changed on the k. That's the only thing that's really uh, going on uh, in, in this. Um, Let's see if I can uh, say anything more. I think that's basically it. I'll use the center screen here uh, for the arithmetic. Okay. So the arithmetic, we've already done this once, and we were doing the waves uh, in a mode for two oscillators, for just two, two things. This is an infinite number of things, and, uh, and I've got set to just show it with 24 or so phasers. But the uh, basic idea is, is to factor this thing and find the zeros, Right, that's what factoring involves. I want to find the zeros of both the real and imaginary part, but I'm really keying on the real part today. The uh, uh, sum, half sum, times the half difference gives me that one. And then I put a minus sign on that one right there. What does that do for me? Okay, well, uh, that gives me this guy right here. When this is multiplied by that, it gives me this guy. So there it is, factored. And this is the phase part of it right here, r plus l a sum. That's the uh, arrow that points up. And then there's the difference over two, okay? So that's this thing minus this thing, which would be, you know, down there. But that would put you over here. Half of that is what the g is. Half of r minus l, okay? All right. Okay, now, uh, the, uh, this is a lecture on space and time, and I'm seeing time does what it does. It gets short, so we're going to do a little bit more here, and then uh, we'll just continue. Um, I'd, I'd rather go so that everyone is following this than rush through it. And uh, uh, yeah, you, you see that there is, well, well it's simple. It's not stuff that you're used to. I'm going to pause this so I can uh, not change uh, back uh, to um, this and do what we really came in here for. And this is the thing that you're going to, um, I'm going to ask you to actually uh, construct this uh, on the graph that you have. This is just showing a picture of what we're doing compared to what Einstein had in his head, apparently. Uh, M M M M Morley, M M uh, Michelson and Morley had definitely in their head is the idea of pulses. Uh, pulses are really simple, but they don't interfere with each other except when they cross, and then it's a most ungodly interference. It's an absolute mess, and then they extricate themselves and continue on their merry way, making an actual baseball diamond in space and time. But it took a lot of Fourier components to do that. That's really complicated. This is simple. This is really simple. Left plus right gives me P and G, a coordinate system. 
an actual lattice in space and time from a reciprocal lattice, which is what this is. Okay? It could be. I could keep adding to make that thing. All right? Okay, so let's go, go here and do a Doppler shift. Now, I'm talking about rapidly moving Bob now. So I'm, I'm going to make Bob move so fast that he turns the uh, 600 terahertz into 1200. Okay? So here's where you draw your first lines on your graph. You have already a 45 degree line, just like we had a 45 degree line that was so important in our uh, very first graph we drew for the collisions. So this 45 degree line here doesn't stop at R. It will continue all the way up to here. And I guess the best name I can give that is R with a prime on it. So that would be what you would draw as an arrow making first base of this baseball diamond into a marathon. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just draw a if you had colored uh, chalk like I do, you would uh, use a, 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 a violet color in order to finish this particular oops, uh, particular uh, thing. Now the question is, and this is something that uh, comes out of that Doppler analysis by rapidity, is that if I get this uh, Doppler shift by a factor of two, by running into this laser right here, this is the laser uh, that's on the uh, right, sending a left wave. That's the thing that's a little confusing about this. So I'm running toward the 600 terahertz with enough speed to get it up to 1200 right here. So uh, cross out the 600 and uh, imagine that it looks like a laser that's putting out 1200. Okay, now the, the uh, thing that I have proved by doing the rapidity dance that we uh, talked about, but this is something I'm going to skip uh, for, for now. You can read about it uh, in the, um, the description of any one of the articles we've written about this stuff, is if I double this one, I've got to have this one. In other words, this one got blue shift, I mean really blue shifted, that one's going to get really red shifted by the same factor too. And it's going to be half the speed. So this one is going to end up over here uh, with looking like, it's going to look like 300. It's going to look like infrared, it's going to look like a nice warm breeze uh, in the uh, summer. Okay? And so it's going to be an arrow that is this big right here. So, um, just draw a fat arrow. Uh, if you have color, you can go home uh, later and make this a, a good graph. And th this graph paper is on the on the web, so you can, you know make all sorts of different uh, diagrams. But the basic idea is now uh, you're going to have a baseball diamond here that uh, has a long marathon to first base, but it only has this much distance to go to second base. So here's the line that you need to add to this uh, to get this uh, um, exactly right. That is, you have to bring this thing uh, on a exa exactly along the diagonal there. In other words, I want to draw a line uh, right along this thing right here. And you can use the graph to help you. I've gone too far with that because I'm going to use my uh, compass here uh, to uh, figure out, uh, make it figure out uh, how, uh, how much uh, length I have uh, to that point. So use your compass uh, to mark off on this line the other side of what is now a rectangle. Okay? So I put the compass right on the uh, graph point and I get right about there, okay? So, it's a short steal to second. Very short. Poof! 
you're there, right? But try to get third now, right? Going to third base, oh my gosh. I mean, I'm already tired from doing the uh, first two bases, so it's going to be a real problem doing that one. Uh, and I won't use this clumsy ruler. I'll use uh, the one that's stuck to the board here uh, to come down uh, to there. Okay, so what I have to do is put this thing right down the diagonal of the uh, graphs from that point uh, right there. And I have little marks on the board there to tell me uh, that that uh, line, I'll use blue for it just for the sake of argument. Okay, so down, 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 down I go. Not quite there yet, but you can see it's a long run uh, to get to there. So we get a new baseball diamond. We get a baseball diamond that is what a baseball diamond looks like when you're sitting in a grandstand. If you're over here, you it's perspective, okay? Isometric perspective, that's exactly what it would be, all right? So what we need to do now is find the pitcher's mount, okay? Now that uh, ru ruler isn't quite big enough, so now I really have to use this monster here. Uh, to find out, first of all, where this diagonal is, and then where this diagonal over here is. Okay, so I need both of those diagonals uh, to uh, finish this diagram because I've got to get the half sum and the half difference. This is the sum right here of those two vectors. So I'll draw that uh, right away. There's the diagonal right there. And that's going to contain my new phase vector. And then I've got to go the other way to get the um, diagonal that contains the group vector. At least a vector that's pointing in the direction. It's, it's really nice to have that magnet when you don't have it. Of course, uh, gravity takes over. Uh, pretty easily uh, on, on these, and it's, it's uh, warped, so it uh, really is bad. Yeah. So you have an easy job here compared to what I'm doing, and this is, uh, you know, in the future when we do this geometry, we'll of course do it on a computer. So I drew most of the drawings that are in the slides. Yeah. You know, here you hold, I'll draw. <laughs> I've got to go about. Um, I gotta go up to there. Is that got it? Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and draw that. Okay. So one of those vectors is in the right place, that is with its rear end on the origin. And so you you use an extra thick line uh, on it. I'm gonna put this guy away. Um, and bring back my nice magnetic uh, fellow here. Uh, this guy right here, this is going to be my new pitcher's mount. Pitcher's mount used to be there, now it's going to be here. It's going to look like it's there. That's a big change. Okay, so here's the, and I usually use uh, blue for the phase vector, dark blue on the screen. Okay, so there's P and uh, since we already used the letter P for the original uh, P down here, this will be P prime. Okay, this is what you would see if you're Bob going this fast. Uh, you're going to see the, uh, your, your phase vector uh, sitting there. Now, uh, you can use your compass to get this vector right here moved down to the origin, so its rear end is on the origin. Um, best way uh, to do that, and even if you didn't have graph paper, right, was to just measure this distance right here from that point, this distance right here, and strike an arc down here, and then put uh, the ruler along the perpendicular of this rectangle, okay, 
and that is about uh, right there. And that should give you, uh, I'll go ahead and just put a dotted line on that. I'm not interested so much in that line uh, for anything physical, but that's about where it ends. And th that is the point that uh, the group vector is going to occupy. Make sure it's pointing at the origin and pointing more or less where I want it to go. So this is going to be uh, the group vector, which I use, uh, I use green. Uh, for it, dark green, but I have a light green here, which is pretty obvious. Okay. So, there, make it a sort of a dash line, um, there is my new G. The old G was down here at 2. This new one is right here above it, and off to the right. Now, the other thing that we need in this construction uh, is to finish the basic unit cell. It used to be, I don't know if I need to use this little thing. Uh, I can do this with the magnetic one. I need to put a ruler from the G to the R, in the sense from the right laser, right, right moving uh, laser. This is the left moving laser. Right one's over there. and. Uh, we're, we're moving in such a way that we run into that eye. Okay, so let me finish this one with this. Okay. So that's the new uh, per space time uh, graph that's predicting where our coordinate lines are going to be in the space time graph. In other words, those are the unit vectors now for the uh, reciprocal cell. That's what this is. And uh, what we're going to be seeing where Bob is uh, uh, standing on these two, um, the UV uh, light uh, here runs into that one, okay, um, we're going to see uh, something uh, quite different. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and start the uh, simulation for that and hope that it works. I've been having trouble here. Yeah, that is go um, one more page forward. Uh, Those were the models. Let me go uh, pause that one. Let me, uh, go back there. Go one more page forward. That's just the one yeah, CW. That's, that's just showing one uh, thing. There's that guy. Bottom corner. And that one should work, right? Yeah. That also has your P and your G there. Like there. Three so we're talking about, whoops, 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 whoops. I've got to get it on there. There we go. And there's Minkowski. That's a Minkowski graph showing everything there is about relativity in terms of space and time. It shows that the length that I had before has contracted. It shows uh, that the length, there's a little parallelogram right there. Okay, shows that this uh, this point right here is moved over. Does the same thing in per space time. The only thing that's different is that now the phase vector is down here. It used to be infinitely fast pointing that way. Now it's just very fast. And then this vector right here used to be zero speed. Now it's very fast. How fast? We can look at the graph and see that. That's kind of neat. The slope of this line right here on your graph, if you've drawn it correctly, the slope of this one right here determines the phase, uh, determines the group velocity over in space time is 3 over 5. That's how fast you have to go to get a, an octave of Doppler shift, a doubling of this frequency and halving of the other frequency. So we've just I mean, too bad Minkowski couldn't see this. Take the, I wouldn't have to do any work <laughs> and be part of the lore. But that's the basic idea. Of it. And then the really screwy thing about this is that the stuff that was infinitely fast, the stuff that we call now, that we call now in this graph, it now tips. 
so that you get to see on this side the past of this of uh, somebody moving through space and time, and on this side you get to look at a little bit of their future. So uh, everything on above that line is the future relative to that particular value of this uh, observer's time. So we'll say more about that later on, and we'll, we'll talk also about the Einstein time dilation. It used to be a, the square used to be about this big. Now it's this big. The square that's drawn on your uh, graph paper isn't a square anymore. It's a rhombus, and it's this rhombus right here. Now in the time graph, you simply draw this again and again and again and again. You just make a whole lattice of these things, which is what you're seeing. The whole lattice of the um, parallelograms, the rhombus, the equilateral rhombus uh, is, a, is a name. Rhomboid, I guess, equilateral rhomboid, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. So that, that's the really deep thing uh, that I um, should stop with, uh, is that we now have special relativity basically handed to us. Now, the scenario that gives you that wave, I can think of three ways to do that. Two really expensive ways, and one no problem, practically zero. If you've got the equipment already and lasers, you can do this right here. This one is to get both of these girls going at three-fifths the speed of light. She shines, Carla shines back at Bob. Uh, she shines forward. She sees Alice as being 1,200. That's a horrible UV. Better be wearing a protective equipment. But 300, oh, it's just a nice warm breeze. Thank you, Carla. Okay. The other way to do it is get Bob off his ass and make him go three-fifths in the other direction. Okay? Pretty much the same thing. It's just that when um, when he, he does that, we got to remember, and this is what's really cool about all of this is everything we're calculating about the frequency changes affects the amplitude in the same way because the amplitude is a frequency too. That that needs more uh, words put behind it, but that's what's going on. Okay, so this is this cause uh, uh, how many billion. Uh, gross national products would it take to get Alice up to 3C5? A lot. And it'd be twice that to get Carlos going up to. So this is really expensive. Here with Bob, okay, given he's maybe uh, goes to the gym a lot, so he's not so heavy, uh, we can get him up to three fifths for, you know, say, gross national product of Paraguay. Okay. And then, <laughs> but that's impossible. Uh, we can't get that money. Maybe Trump can. But anyway, uh, Bob stationary, Carla tunes down, Alice tunes up, and that's the way to do it for nothing. Same thing, except for the amplitude, which we'll play with later on. And you can always put neutral density filters in to bring the amplitudes equal. It is essential to get equal amplitudes. You get really crazy behavior when the amplitudes change, and that's what you can see by playing with board, um, changing the amplitude a little bit. You get things that um, well, you get, you get tracks that look like antiparticle creation and destruction. That's what happens. So, you know, we're on the verge here of playing with some pretty hairy stuff just by playing with waves. Okay, so we've got more to do. Now, is this, do you, I'm just sort of, you know, what do you think? Do you, do you feel good about this or do you want to go back to the old, uh, the old notations? Because the numbers that we're going to put down for uh, these wave quantities, the kappa of the group, the lambda of the group, the frequency of the group, the velocity of the group, okay, and then the period of the group. And that. So this is all group stuff. And then there's the phase stuff, same thing, velocity of the phase, the lambda of the phase. Happens to use the same numbers. This nu of phase here is the same as the kappa of the group. The lambda of the group is the same as the tau of the phase. That's you know, something we, we, we look at when we look at the algebra uh, carefully. It's because it's a rhombus. Okay? So, basically there's a, there's a cosh because we do half sums and half differences of the Doppler red 
plus the Doppler blue and minus over two. That's what gives these uh, things here. But meanwhile, perpendicular to that uh, motion is a light wave that's changing its sigma angle. And those are the, the changes that it undergoes. So we're taking care of that as well. Two, two birds for the price of one here because the trigonometry is both hyperbolic and circular at the same time. Cool? I thought so, but then I'm biased. <laughs> okay, well, we'll attack it on Monday, but in the meantime, go ahead and finish. Because I'm going to ask, I'm going to pick a random speed, some, you know, some sort of speed, and you're going to come in on, on the exam day, which is uh, supposedly 3 to 5 p.m. You won't need anywhere near that much time, I hope, once you know what, you know, what we do. We've got half the, half the number of lines we need for the complete destruction of everything. I mean, we've got Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, it's all in there. They're all hiding in there, all this stuff. It's all hiding in this crazy little geometry. Okay.